Former pilot Flying J President Mark Hazelwood sentenced to 150 months in federal prison. Safer salads hit the shelves in 2019. Gig driver wages are falling and their numbers are increasing. We do five good minutes with Keith Mader, the VP of analytics for Trimble Transportation. Goldman Sachs thinks trucking rates will peak in the fourth quarter and gradually decline in 2019. And finally, North Carolina residents sue CSX for failure to prevent devastating floods. I'm JP. And I'm Chad. And we discuss all these topics and more on this week's episode of What the Truck. Hey, what's up, man? How you what doing? What is going on? Uh, it's great to be here with you. Um, that You read those headlines so beautifully. Um, so... Um, well, what are you drinking this week? Well, um, I'm sorry to say that it is not a Bell's Too Hearted. That's what happens oh. when you. That's what happens when I allow my co-host to make the pre-podcast beer run. So oh. instead, I'm <laughs> sipping on an admittedly delicious Hudden and Smith Tectonic Session IPA. You're such which, a good sport. Which is, you know, because I played a dirty trick on you. <laughs> Well, it's, you know, it turned out not to be so bad. You know, it's it's a nice beer. It hits me with a really, I think, fresh, cool, um, kind of citrusy um, on, on the kind of top of the mouth. I like where your palate's um, at. It's, it's kind of a diamond in the rough. You know, it's it's an IPA <laughs> that's that's actually suitable for beach drinking. I really, oh, I know. It's, it's a Nipa that's sessionable. I really like it, too, although... Um, I just wanted to share the love, man. Like Hutton and Smith, really doing it. Name it to the tectonic. Um, they they said is is um, they named it for their favorite tavern, the Tremont Tavern. Or, or I, I they, no, they made it for the Tremont. Made tavern. it for okay. them, yeah. not named it, right? Because right. that wouldn't have made sense. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I was just about to be confused by. Uh, and then I'm drinking uh, a High Wire Brewery out of uh, Asheville, the High Pitch Mosaic IPA. Um, as opposed to the low pitch. And I have a bad feeling you're about to ask me what the difference is. Yeah, you, you don't know, though. Uh, well, the only thing I do know is that one has a higher ABV than the I other. See. So, I see. Uh, well, that's, 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 and it's that's... Mosaic Hops, which is a, you know, a cross. It's like they're a, they're a hybrid hop. They're very popular. Oh, cool. Kind of piney. Right. I actually like that. I like pine. I like grapefruit. That's what you know. I'm, yeah, I'm that's, too, you like mosaic. Though. I'm a too harder person. Mm-hmm. Although that's um, centennial hops. Should but we you stop know, talking about hops. <laughs> um, we can stop talking about hops. But uh, no, I mean it's great. It's uh, you know what I mean. This is a this is a this is our big new day where you are legit drinking a different beer. Wow. Here on what like is it? Are we at episode thirty? I mean, is there a like is this is this an anniversary or is it twenty nine? I mean, I don't I'll, know. I'll crack a beer up into it's our, gr- our anniversary chat. Well, it's great to <laughs> have uh, Lexi with us this yes. time. Uh, not so silent, Lexi, uh, with just. <laughs> Um, but uh, as opposed to Silent Bear, why, why don't we um, why don't we get into it, man? You had some really big news break yesterday. You were at the courthouse in the room when this went down. Tell us what happened to Mark Hazelwood. Well, um, you know, I went in for sentencing at nine a.m. yesterday, and uh, expecting you know this to be. I think you said you told me to be expect this is going to be straightforward. So yeah, I, I didn't know what I was talking about. I thought that I would be out, you know, by 10, you know, and I would have like a whole day ahead of me. Um, instead, um, I sat there um, and didn't learn the verdict until about 4.15. And we did break for lunch. Um, but it was a very, this is the thing, like, it's it's quite an experience, you know. I mean, I guess the the... The hard part about it is you feel like because it's a full pack court, and so when are you getting in? When you're getting out, it felt a little like trying to catch like you're on a travel schedule and you've got to catch the plane. If you miss the plane, then you know everything is destroyed. So you have to make the plane, and so there's a lot of hurry up and wait. Right. And so the the overall feeling about it is this is my experience yesterday was you you're sitting in church for eight hours. You know, while tra- having to catch planes and make connections uh, and without a phone because you're not allowed to bring your phone into the courthouse. Uh, and at the same time, someone's fate is at stake. 
I mean, it's just really... It's kind of all over the place. It's a surreal experience. Um, you know, the long and short was that, you know, Judge Collier um, uh, did, you know, as the headline says, um, Hazelwood got 150 months, which uh, sounds like a lot. About 12 and a um, half years. Well, it is, it is a lot, but um, actually in reading his decision... Um, you know, uh, Judge, Judge Collier said that actually the proceedings of that day and the arguments that the defense put forth to have leniency did have an effect on him. He said that after reading his like for about 30 minutes, his decision, his well-reasoned and thoughtful decision that, that took into account all these things. And at the end of it, he, he, had, he had made this argument with the three-pronged approach that he's supposed to take within the sentencing guidelines. And he said that because each of the, the prongs that he considered, he felt like he thought that actually the sentence could exceed the sentencing guidelines Whoa. of 168 months. Wow. And so he comes to the end of that and you're starting to, if you are really listening, you're starting to realize that he is about to deliver a heavy sentence. Yeah. And then he comes in and, and kind of splits the difference between 135 and 168. Right. It's and sort he of a and moderate, says 150. Yeah. And then and then at the very, I was ready to dash out to, to go report the news. I'm glad I waited another beat because then he said, you know, um, I, you know, he said, as I, I was going to sentence at the, you know, at the far end of the guidelines, but because of um, the arguments today, it was very persuasive, and I came down to this. It still seems harsh. Or are you well, like it's like, like it, it's, it's middle of, of the road? Middle of the road for the crimes that he got convicted and, of. And uh, you know, as he said, the, all is, roads led to Mr. Hazelwood. Uh, yeah, you know, and, and it to, affected at least. It was an extraordinary case. The judge said because it's a white collar crime that systematically involved, you know, like lots of other people that were right. under him. And just um, to back up for our listeners, this is all, you know, for people who don't necessarily follow the story. Uh, basically, Pilot Flying J was targeting right. small and mid sized trucking carriers, and they were offering them. Um, pretty generous uh, rebates. They're they sort of offering them discounted fuel rates in the form of rebates. Um, but then they were going back and changing the rebates after the fact without telling them, f- essentially fraudulently. And um, it was jokingly referred to as the, the manual rebate. And yeah. They sometimes called it the manual rebate. Right, right. Be- um, because it was sometimes the less sophisticated people in fact, I think that's what they, 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 you know, the less sophisticated players in the system, even Didn't whether have... or not they were large or midsize, if they weren't sophisticated enough with their means of processing the sort of complicated mathematical algorithm that Pilot and used. That and like keeping track of average fuel prices, you know, having the data professionals to audit, you know, yeah. r- really the stuff coming through, you know, com data and things like that. Um yeah, so they ripped them off. I mean, it was you know more than a hundred million dollars, I think. And um, I, I, I don't know that that that, that was the number. I, I don't. I've heard different numbers. That they were pilot flying J was forced to pay back after audits um, fifty six million to the okay, damage parties. Okay. Um, I know and, that, I know that, and, I know that some of the people it, haven't settled yet. Okay. Uh, they also, and then there was an additional twelve that I don't. But with it, within in during the courtroom arguments, like in the session just yesterday, um, they they you know the defense said it was only thirty seven million, and then you know, but then they came back to fifty six, and they said, well, no, fifty six was paid. Um, now maybe a percentage of that was you know to go above and beyond because of damages. Whatever the case, however much, fr- because of course the defense was wanting to minimize the amount that was taken in the first place, right. so that the amount that the the calculus of like how much the sentencing guidelines, not the sentencing guidelines well, in this but, case, but just how well, yeah, it would affect that, but but how much um, uh, Hazelwood was actually getting. You know, it, oh, it, see, is I a see. part of his three point five percent after net profits. Right, right, right. You right, know, right. which they said turned out to be about twenty one thousand dollars a year, and that's not enough money to motivate him to really aggressively participate right. in this scheme. Um, the art, the defense argued, right. um, and Collier wasn't and, buying and, that. Yeah, well, because I mean, 
the thing was, and, you know, I, I, I sat through a, a decent amount of this trial. Yeah. And it seemed to did. me that the people involved in this conspiracy, and there were a number of them. I mean, I think, I want to say 19 people pled guilty, four yeah. people were in the, the trial, all got convicted of different things. Karen Mann, you know, not, so, not as much as other people. but 20. 20 were officially in yeah. some way. That's what Collier said yesterday. Um, So... It seemed to me that what it was about, it was about competitiveness. It was about, you know, arrogance. It was about basically can't as a sales rep, can I steal a customer from say loves by right. offering them this rebate, you know, underselling the competition. Yeah. It but affected still, those businesses. But then going back and changing it and still getting, yeah. and still getting that juicy margin that I wanted. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, was, it was, it was about often, you know, yeah. Often enough, and uh, um, and it, you know, and it, there were other players in it. Um, but this is the yesterday in this, you know, the um, the court. Um, this is what Judge Collier said. He said the court is obliged to consider the aspects of retribution, deterrence, and rehabilitation. That's the three pronged factor: retribution, like you know, kind of delivering justice about something; deterrence, like thinking about like. Not you know other players in this in this right, and, right. Then, and then to the extent to rehabilitation which you might think of as irrelevant but none of them were irrelevant like he he said um, at the end of his final statement um, Collier said you know all roads lead back to Hazelwood so he's the first one to get sentenced um, he said when um, because because when it came to the culture. So in terms of retribution, his sentence, like he, he was setting the tone of the culture. Why were there no, you know, um, you know, why, why didn't finance people speak out? Why weren't there audits within the company done? Well, it was the ultimately because Hazelwood was. Why were why were like new sales reps trained to do to break the law? Oh, right. Because of Hazelwood. Yeah, 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 yeah. So right. For deterrence. The judge considered like he was like, and this is interesting for us as a data company ourselves at Freight Waves with, with the uh, with the increase in data technology and this kind of crime only possibly growing. Right. Um, you know, the, he also thought that going above the guidelines might be merited for deterrence. And then also for rehabilitation, Collier said, you know, he said, usually this isn't an issue in white collar crime, but Mr. Hazelwood is different as he owns several businesses and due to his competitive nature, we must also consider this too. <laughs> and so, Interesting. Uh, yeah, wow, that's, that's fascinating. Yet nevertheless, um, it's, you know, it's a serious it a- thing. I mean, it's one thing, to, you know, for us to, you know, be in the courtroom during the trial and get like, you know, the, 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 you know, the detail, you know, the, the hot details straight, you know, from the prosecution or whatever and, and go and, and print them and talk about the scandalous recording right. and all the different criminal informants and who was wearing a wire when and all that stuff. But when you get down to it, yeah. like watching someone get sentenced to 12 years in prison yeah. is heavy. It is. Uh, it was heavy yesterday. Um, and I'm going to you know, kind of write out all the notes that I wrote about it tomorrow. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I don't, I, it's, um, uh, I think this is m- maybe one of the, the, th- the, the things that's hard to process about it is almost everyone in that courthouse was a sympathizer was like, was on, on, uh, Hazelwood's side. It was his family and friends and is packed and 168 letters were written on his behalf, right, right. Um, you know, and, uh, and which was very persuasive. And Mr. Co- Judge Collier said that he read every single one of them um, and that that factored into his, you know, decisions, um, decision. But um, what was it? Oh, but like what my overall takeaway at the very end of it was like, was this feeling of, you know, humans are so complicated and we, we have a saint side to us. And we have like a sinner side. There's this duality in us. And, right, right. you know, and like, because on the, Mark Hazelwood was beloved by a lot of people. Um, and uh, the, there, he did a lot for communities. He did a lot, not only like giving to charities in an abstract kind of way, but he also like has apparently like, you know, just been involved with 
like um you know a, a mom who had lost her 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 child i think you know and he really took this kid under his wing and um you know helped fund his college and went to his football games and you know just like you know what was a faithful supporter to his to his uh family and you know came from you know and this is apparently according to judge collier also this is a very familiar white collar crime story like came from humble beginnings this is yeah. actually you know that's actually a very familiar familiar hmm. trope interesting um and uh, worked very hard and, and, and so there's like you know there's right. um you, 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 and it's interesting but mean, he it's, yet <clears throat> nevertheless he did do these 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 things he was guilty right and and there there, there were there was um you know, like he was, he made during the span of time in question of oh, 2008 to 2013, um, 75 million dollars. You know, like right. that's that's, that's a lot of money. that is a, a lot of money to make in five years. Um, so, um, it was quite a day. It's almost as much money as podcast hosts make. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. We are just no, but it's rolling. cool. It's it's really, I think, it speaks a lot to Judge Collier and the way that he conducted the trial that he really created space in the courtroom for you know the complexity of he sure you know, did of, of mark hazelwood as a person show the nuances talk about the whole person he did what you know, yeah you know i don't know what you're like how much you guys to see him in action um over the course of the days that you were in there but my overall takeaway was this guy is a wise man who has seen it all a lot. Although this was an extraordinary case, I don't think he had quite seen the likes of. Right, right. Um, Anyway, he handled it with efficiency, decorum. Um, I think he was deeply respected. Like, yeah, you know, oh, for sure, for sure. So. Yeah, that, that's... That's it. That's that's helpful. Okay. Well, uh, safer salads at the, tri- <laughs> <laughs> hit the shelves in 2019. No, um, this is a great. Well, this we're is... going from the duality of human nature <laughs> to uh, leafy greens on the blockchain. Yeah. Well, this is actually the reason that we've got a variety of stories we're covering um, uh, today, and we need to we need to pick up the tempo a little bit. I think, um, but it's, uh, you know, after an, um, like we've, we've, we've covered Wal here. Okay. Here's the thing. Walmart is getting on the blockchain big time, requiring hundreds of suppliers to get on the blockchain so right. that we, cause they, they want to bring us into the 21st century with, with food safety recall. Wow. Walmart. Cool. I'm in. Well, and that's how, you know, I think the big shippers are the ones who really drive technological adoption in the space. So it's, Whoa. if Walmart tells well you that they want it to happen, it's going to happen. Like, yeah, right. And they, and this is about their, their right. third significant foray. But I think perhaps of those, of those uh, blockchain, uh, not attempts, but, you know, pushes, this is going to be significant. Yeah. And I'm, beef is next, I think, right? Meats or net, mm. like there's, some, but but coming right up. That makes sense. Um, it's really interesting. You know, it's really interesting to see them doing this. You know, they have a largely you know dedicated fleet. Um, they also purchase transportation though, so I'm interested to see. You know, yeah. are there going to be gaps in the ledger? Like like who? Ooh, like are they going to require? Yeah. Are they going to require people who drive for them? to use some sort of blockchain if they're hauling these sorts of commodities. And what's interesting is that they're using this with, um, you know, with IBM. Um, They're calling it their IBM Food Trust Network. They've been working and partnering with IBM. So IBM gets a big, you know, a big boost. I guess they've been seeing this coming for a while. Yeah, and it it reminds me of IBM's deal with Maersk as well, Ah, partnering with these giant enterprises that have significant market share starting with them first and letting them kind of throw their weight around and you know make all of their kind of suppliers and subsidiaries and partners sort of you know come along with them good job ibm way to be uh ambitious and visionary in this space uh i i hope that we're still seeing public open source uh blockchain uh, I don't know about this proprietary stuff, but uh, hey, th- th- this is a good day. This is a good day for blockchain. And it's a good day right? for people it's who eat lettuce inter- pro- and don't eat something else. But I mean, uh, it's inter- it's an enterprise application, as you're saying. Yeah. Wide, massive scale, massive market share. Um, it's not about cryptos. 
It's about blockchain it's, yeah, it's and not enterprise. About crypto, it's not about Ethereum network. It's not about like a, right. a, a public permissionless network. But, you know, I mean... It's just it's, this practical application. Yeah, and it's awesome that they are really behind it and they're driving innovation. That's that's cool. I mean, we, we've known for a long time that Walmart has some of the most forward-thinking supply chain people in the world. Yeah. And, you know, it seems like they're, you know, proving it once again i'm i'm digging me some some walmart blockchain application you know <laughs> uh, uh, uh and you know another we have a, a kind of um you know a, a gig economy story um which is an inter an interesting study came out um that um well it's it's interesting it's so this is i don't know what like i mean i guess there's a bad news but kind of still good news um, yeah, so John Kingston wrote this story, and it was Chase's really study. study. And what they did was they took sort of anonymized data from you know tons and tons of different bank accounts of people getting payments from like uh, different gig economy companies, including you know we think of Uber and Lyft, but there's actually like I want to say like by the end of the study that they did, which is like a five year long study. Um, there were like 30 something different transportation companies. So it's not just Uber. Right. But Uber and Lyft are the majority. And, what and was, measure, yeah, that, that's a big part of their, their, their measurement. Yeah. So this, some of the numbers are a little weird to look at, but it's between 2013 and 17. And basically, you know, the conclusions are kind of what you would expect. Like as people flock into these um, companies, these, these platforms, yeah. as the, the drivers swell their ranks, average wages and take home money goes down like pretty drastically. I mean, over the, yeah, cor- like, over right. the course of the study, um, you know, there's been a drop since 2013 from the average monthly platform earnings. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. From, yeah. from, from, from almost 1500 to 783 um, it, over the, so about cut in half. But I think the take what, what they were wondering is like, well, well, why actually? So the good news in a sense is that I don't know if this is something that you would think would be expected, but um, you yeah, know, cause you said the numbers are what we expect, but like the, the average pay kind of went up a little bit and stabilized while the, the kind of, dispersion of how many people spent their time driving did go down. And I think they're, they're, they're kind of analyzing, well, why they're asking why. Right. And And what, what Chase doesn't have good visibility into is, uh you know, did you, did it become truly like a flexible kind of gig job where, people are driving less and that's why they're making less. Like is the average driver driving fewer hours and that's why they're making less money or is something happening with rates and overcapacity and things like that? Is it the booming economy as well? They don't have any information about that, but like while employment is high, you know, but this, the the takeaway is this, like I think people learned and it, over this period of time, I think that they learned that this is not going to be a full-time gig for you. Right. That's the bad news. So right. what does it say about the gig economy? It's not making these huge, giant, awesome jobs that everybody, oh, we're going to all be online. We're going to be doing this and making well, yeah, it. Well, yeah, I think it, it reveals its true nature. It's, it's a gig, right? It's something you do in your spare time. It's huh, something you yeah. do, you know, in between jobs. It's something you do, you know, if you've, you know, if you're a freelance, yeah. a freelancer, you know, you might have a couple extra hours. You might right. do a couple rides. And like, to and me, that's the good news. I was going to say, like, there's still this this economy that you can participate in. There's still this means to it. You know, you can still, like, be like, hey, I got a car and I need some cash and I'm going to turn on my Uber. I'm available. And, hey, the call's in and I'm going to go, you know? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't think it was ever meant to be a full-time job in the way that, like, well, being a taxi driver is. I thought that's news to the Uber drivers in New York right now, right? <laughs> yeah. I think that, you know, the, they probably get trying to support a family. Yeah. But um, so uh, anyway, it is uh, an interesting study covered and we just like to keep everybody up to date on cool things like, you know, the very, the little beginning points of smart cities, which. All right. Is it time for five good minutes? It so is. All right. Let's get into it. What the truck is back coming to you from the Insight 2018 conference in Houston, Texas, brought to you by Trimble. 
And we are visited right now by none other than Keith Mater, the VP of Analytics for Trimble Transportation. Mater worked, uh, has worked at Trimble Transportation Enterprise, formerly TMW, for nearly 20 years, where he's led efforts to globalize the TM, TMW Suite product line and overseen the first TMW application as a service offering. And during his time at TMW, Mater has established a professional product management practice across multiple lines of business and recently formalized the product architecture function as well. Keith Mater, welcome to What the Drug. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. Sessions are about to begin. Wow. And without further ado, are you ready to run the gauntlet of this five good minutes? Absolutely. Let's okay. Do it. Ready or not, here we come. Tell us about your background in Trimble and how you came into this role. Sure. As you said, uh, 20 years ago, I, I was sitting in Dave Mook's office, one of the founders of uh, TMW. And I thought to myself, you know, transportation, as a developer out of, out of college, had my first job, thought, boy, this, how hard can this be, this transportation thing, right? Uh, you move something from A to B, maybe you bill somebody for it, you pay someone. I was certain six months later in 1999 I'd be looking for a sweet Y2K job at SAP or Oracle or something along those lines. Uh, but transportation is interesting. As you guys know, it's all about family. You get to know, you start to get to know the people more than you do the, the problem space and you, you get involved in their businesses. So you, you either fall in love with it or you end up hating it, uh, maybe a little bit of both. But uh, 20 years later, multiple roles with TMW's organization and most recently uh, just moving over to the PeopleNet or Trimble Mobility Group to really start to bridge the gap between the two companies and bring things together. Uh, nothing like transplanting talent from around the organization to different spots. Uh, you saw that with Mark Botticelli, who's now our CTO over all of transportation. Yeah. And I have that same function uh, from an analytics perspective. So, so go ahead. yeah, you just um, were talking a little bit about analytics and integration. What is the role of analytics in the One Trimble story? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because we see analytics as sort of a glue at, on the end of, of transactions. So you've got TMW, TMS data that comes in. You've got PeopleNet, PFM, uh, fleet data that comes in. When you can put it together, you can do amazing things. Uh, we, we just launched a driver retention algorithm and platform that we, we've announced here. And we're able to look at that data and tell you which what your top five drivers who are going to quit. Who are they and why are they going to quit? Yeah. So, you know, analytics really gives you the opportunity to solve problems uh, on scale. And that's really what One Trimble is all about creating scale across all sorts of solutions, uh, bringing all that data into one place. You can answer, answer, answer interesting questions uh, who's the most efficient driver? Who's going to quit? Um, who's safe? Who's not safe? Uh, and really control and manage your fleet that way. Absolutely. We're just, just listening to a little bit of how the data can be aggregated toward that uh, very end. Well, what are you guys, I mean, in this in this year of, you know, the, the a capacity crunch and a, and, the, and a tech boom, what are, you, what are you hoping to see for the remainder of 2018 and, and rolling into 2019? What, what are you guys trying to accomplish? Yeah, well, it, it goes with continuing to bring the solutions closer together. Uh, so driver retention, knowing which drivers are going to leave is great. Having an intervention platform like we do so they can record conversations and take a proactive stance on helping Tommy stay with the company or Sally stay with the company. Uh, it's deeper integration. How do I put that into the decision when you gave Sally the bad load to begin with? So it's going to be about taking that, that data and those analytics and smarts and empowering them back into the underlying solutions where the person who can make a difference is actually has that at their fingertips. So I'm about to put you on a load that's going to adversely affect your driver score, and it looks like a great load. It's got a lot of miles. It's got a lot of pay. But I don't realize your home time's been pretty low lately. Uh, you're pretty frustrated. Uh, your, your fatigue monitoring that we can see from the data looks like you're slamming on the gas, slamming on the brakes. You might be angry. You know, something might be going on there. So if we can bring that back into the actionable systems, uh, we, we really got something. Uh, and that and that's where, where we see us taking our analytics products for. I, I see a lot of um, a lot of how that data can be aggregated, and it's really powerful. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you think though, from a managerial point of view, does it take flexibility and open-mindedness to, to interpret and, and, and utilize this data? Yeah, 
the phrase "the math is always right," right? It's true. <laughs> the, you know, the, you can build a, a formula. You can you can tell yourself an answer. These are human beings, right? So yeah. you have to have the right level of touch and humanity along with an algorithm. Uh, you know, Sally, I think you're going to leave because you're running hot. Uh, you get on the phone and find out, no, maybe it's you just don't give me good choices or planning tools to take my breaks. So I mean, there, there's, maybe I'm stressed out by something happening at home. Yeah, yeah. And and when you can see those behaviors, if all we do is initiate the conversation, we're confident we're going to help people keep people and retain them. But it's it's not robots, right? We're not talking about uh, yeah. robots here. We're talking about human beings that they want to be treated like human beings. So how do we take data and take the digital world and transform it in a way that you can do something meaningful with it and, and human with it? Uh, because it. it's all about people. Wow, awesome. fantastic. And you are coming in right under the mark. Right Four under minutes, the mark. 55 seconds. Congratulations, we Keith. Such fantastic you did it. Guests. I think Man. I won a pair of headphones. <laughs> <laughs> He's made up his own gift. It's great. It's great. <laughs> thanks, guys. Uh, Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks yeah, so great. much for stopping by. Thanks for your time, Keith. Glad, Glad to do it. Fantastic. Cool. Would love to have you on again sometime. Sure, thanks. thanks okay. So Good luck. Have a great conference. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And that was wonderful, remembering that conversation uh, with Keith Mater. Yeah, he's a smart dude. He was fun as well. Um, and uh, So the next thing we have is this report that our friends at Goldman Sachs sent us. Yeah. Um, we've kind of uh, made connections with a couple of the transportation equities analysts there, sort of on the research side, and they you know, kind of... When they have a new report coming out, send it over to us, and so we can have a look and you know comment on it and things like that. Yeah. And the long and short of this report is that they said that the most common investor question that they get is, you know, how long is this pricing cycle for trucking yeah. going to last? Are we at the peak? Have we passed the peak? What's the deal? Um, and you know, essentially, Goldman Sachs. Uh, you know, uh, team led by um, Matt Russell um, said that there's going to be another spot. There's another spot rate peak in our future in the, the fourth quarter. Spot rates will get you know high again, you know, potentially higher than ever, followed by a gradual decline in 2019. And they attribute that gradual decline to increasing capacity. They say that actually when you look at the really yeah. aggressive wage increases that the large carriers have been implementing, when you look at you know uh, Department uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data, when you look at truck orders, we've added we're adding drivers um, at a f- the fastest rate we've done in, in years, and so eventually that's going to alleviate some of this tightness um they did say though that thirty-one thousand over this year something like that in the in the, thir- in the 30s uh yeah. which is super high and they attribute it to the about uh since june of 2017 a 12 percent increase in, in overall driver yeah, pay yeah yeah which is so that's good massive um and to me what i thought was interesting about how you've said you you were mentioning um, that, you know, it's going to reach these things and then, then even, you know, it's going to level out in certain ways, but the pay will remain, they anticipate the exactly. same. Exactly. So one of the reasons why, so Goldman said that, um, even though they expect a gradual decline over the course of 2019 in trucking spot rates, those rates in 2019 are still going to be about, you know, they call it, the, you know, double digit percentages higher than the previous cycle, which lasted from 2012 to 2017. So we, we've, we've made a step change up. And a big part of that is the increases in wages, which you can't really roll back. You can't, you can't take that away once you've given it out. And driver wages make up about 40% of the cost of transportation. So you see how yep. once you... It's a new so fixed cost. It's a new sort of floor. For, for 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 the cost of transportation in a way, and yeah. they had some really interesting stuff to say about, um, you know, how you know the um, basically investors have been really skittish toward the trucking um, sector um, ever since Werner Enterprises had a really you know um, amazing second quarter earnings call, 
All be, what ha, it was crazy. Like all these trucking companies said, we're doing awesome. We're doing awesome. We're doing awesome. And then everyone started selling the stocks off and they're all their stock prices started going down because <sighs> all the investors essentially thought that they were at, we're at the peak. Oh, right. And so, and so they started selling them off and there's been, a, you know, a night swift has lost about 20%. And then it becomes a psychological, we're going yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, so what, what Goldman was interested in was, I, I thought kind of cool. They were saying, well, what, which stocks are best poised right now? Which companies are best poised right now? So, you know, to ride out this peak and even the decline yeah. that they predict in 2019, which companies will still be able to make money? They said Landstar because of its, um, you know, its uh, BCO model. Uh, basically, it helps it uh, protect itself against um, spot rate volatility. They said that XPO, XPO's LTL business is less cyclically volatile than truckload. They should be fine. Um, interestingly, they actually, the most significant change in their price targets was Knight Swift. I think they dropped Knight Swift from forty seven dollars to forty two dollars, but and they said okay. it's not because of the earnings. You're getting a little granular. No, 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 getting no, a little. I don't, I don't know how many are. Okay, I know, but we're talking about the biggest trucking company in America. Um, they said and several others. No, that's <laughs> this is great. Yeah, yeah. They said that uh, it's Night you know, Swift. We're 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 optimistic about their earnings. We think they're gonna. We're revising our earnings estimates upward, but we're revising our multiple downward. So they thought that Knight Swift would trade at about 18.6 times its earnings. Now they think it should really trade about about 17.2 times earnings. And it's because these okay. they, after the merger, they haven't really been able to find synergies. Knight is, you know, the, the right. idea was like when you do this merger. Different cultures. Different cultures, completely different business models. And completely so they different. don't really yeah. work together. Knight trades at about a 20x multiple Swift trades out about a 15x multiple, and it seems like Swift is being a little bit of a drag on the combined fleet's stock price. Wow. Okay. Um, well, that is the way to way to you know bring us bring us uh, up into some uh, granularities. Um, and, and we got this uh, nice last overview. last story, uh, last headline of the day um, from Ashley Coker. Who uh, wrote about this on Thursday? Wow, is C has CSX messed up? Oh my I'm God. outraged. Yeah, I know. I was like, like shocked. How many different ways can you mess up? And tell then, us, and then, tell us about what happened in well, um, Lumberton, North Carolina. Lumberton, which happens to be shocker, a a uh, a very poor area, but um, but you know CSX. Um, has this uh, underpass that is a point was a p- point of vulnerability for major flooding. Um, the um, the you know m- city officials and people in the area and scientists and you know people in business like they they all recognize that there was this vulnerability. Yeah, so it's, 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 the, they, the CSX overpass has essentially created this hole in the city's levees, a gap in the city's levees. That that the levees that would protect them from floods. I didn't know that there was specifically a hole from the yeah, article. Okay, right. well, it's I knew that there were vulnerabilities, whatever yeah. they. And uh, the long and short of it, I suppose, is that um, they they were repeatedly asked. Like, there it's private property, so the city can't just come in and do these things. And they were repeatedly asked and even in, offered money to like help repair it and all these things over the years. They basically just denied, denied, denied. The you know anybody that could do anything. So, so this is so leading. Well, I I just wanted to get us right yeah, up to yeah, the yeah, yeah, go for uh, it. well lead, leading. <laughs> up to the exciting hurricane you know the 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 drama of the event is hurricane um hurricane florence was was coming down on them and they're like you you tell us like finish well so this happened i was gonna say this happened years ago with hurricane matthew oh right csx is the reason why lumberton flooded they did a bunch of impact um studies over the floods they found out this was the reason yeah then hurricane florence is looming down you know it's it's coming 
It's going to flood. It's coming. We have plenty of, of warning. We talked about it for a week before it and, came. And the Lumberton um, officials were basically like, please, CSX, please let us put some sandbags down. Let, let, us, us, let us create a, a temporary barrier is what they asked yeah, yeah. first. And then, the, and then that and was CSX, denied. CSX was like, if you come on our property, we will arrest you for trespassing. Well, at first that was denied. Then they said, well, can we just put sandbags up? Yeah, and they and said, well, that's and, when and they they said, said, we'll give you $3 million. Like, please. <laughs> And CSX and, and, and was just like blithely just like, oh, I mean, I don't know. As far as I don't see any reasoning behind, they just said no. And you have and like repeatedly, like it was very stubborn. Yeah. Like, and, then, and, and then, you know, the town flooded and now they are suing CSX. Right. The town like, of course, then like get like, this. Oh, finally, the governor. Here's an interesting part of the story. Governor Roy Cooper eventually allowed city leaders to place sandbags across the underpass on September 14th, and that emergency berm bought residents some time before it eventually broke on the 17th. Right. And then, um, yeah, like it's, it's, I don't know, it's yeah. extensive damage. Like I mean, you mint two thousand homes and also businesses. Um, it's a class action lawsuit. Oh, and then can I, can I read the CSX response? Yeah, please do. (laughs) Okay. So here, this is what a CSX spokesperson just said in a statement. While CXS does not comment on matters before the court, it is important to point out that Hurricane Florence was an extraordinary storm that brought record flooding and left many communities throughout the region devastated, including Lumberton. Right. Um, re- like, and uh, they didn't want to help at all. That's real. That's all you have to set. Like, I don't. Oh. CS, like, CSX also wanted to trumpet the fact that they contributed one hundred thousand dollars to Hurricane Relief. Oh um, my this gosh. is a company that made eight hundred and seventy-seven million dollars in net earnings in the second quarter okay. of, of this year, and a uh, hundred thousand dollars toward a storm that cost about twenty billion. I've I've just about heard enough bad news today. I know uh, it, that it, the, like that it just does you, not reflect well on CSX. Yeah. That, uh, that just that just tells you so. Some, it's a PR nightmare. It's a humanitarian nightmare. It's just like you know, America is is unique in the fact that we have allowed railroads to become very large powerful wealthy corporations most other countries they're state-owned and you know we regulate them with the service transportation board but you know they're honestly they're fairly lightly regulated at this point um you yeah know, you've got the positive train control things like that but i mean in terms of how much money they make uh you know the government says like have at it and so it's it's really disappointing that they won't even attempt to make you know do a bare minimum gesture of corporate responsibility for the, you know, the communities that they hold property in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, All right. And now it's time to play big deal or little deal. Let's do it. Uh, we had been on such a good roll, JP until blowing it completely last week. Sorry, man. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry too. It's a team <laughs> effort, man. Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, I don't know. Uh, anyway, here we go. And we're going to, it's all happening. And uh, are you ready? Blockchain port clearance system to be launched at Shanghai and Guangdong. Big deal or little deal? It's a huge deal. Shanghai is the biggest, busiest container port in the world. Crude oil prices rally to a four year high. Big deal or little deal? It's a big deal. Um, you know, this is a huge commodity. Um, it's, it's, you know, hopefully there won't be another crash and burn like we saw in 2014. Will Iran become the next Venezuela? Big deal or little deal? Um, it's kind of a big deal. Um, if they really collapse, it could remove about 2 million barrels a day from the global supply. FMCSA eliminates requirement for military CDL holders to pass knowledge driving skill tests. Big deal or little deal? It's a little deal um, in terms of its effect on capacity, but it's a big deal in terms of what it signals about FMCSA's willingness to relax regulations on trucking. Parade releases AI-powered carrier platform for brokerages with a focus on relationships. Big deal or little deal? Big deal. Awesome AI engine enables freight brokerage teams to reutilize carriers' data to, cr- data to create consistent capacity and automate grunt work. <laughs> Boxlot combines 
Innovation and simplicity to curb porch pirates. Big deal or little deal? Big deal. It's simplicity is in its genius, and they're going to be on Shark Tank October 7th at 10 p.m. Denim amendment booted from final FAA reauthorization bill. Big deal or little deal? Little deal. ATA lost the battle, but the war's not over. They're suing California. Brazil, premium for its soybeans, could see Chinese buyers increasing shipments from the U.S. Big deal or little deal? Big deal. We're seeing losses in the supply chain that could take decades to work back from, but, you know, what's what's to worry about? Do we do it? We did it! Lexi says one minute and 43 seconds. Yay! What, what, hey. Lexi giving us some good Way to come back juju. from last week, dude. Yes! Good job. Wow. <laughs> you were so succinct. And that'll do it for the big stories this week. As always, we go into more detail about each of the topics we've talked about today on our website, FreightWaves.com. We will continue to publish this podcast weekly, so be sure to subscribe to What the Truck on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. Also, make sure to leave us a review to let us know what you think of our new podcast. And if you're interested in freight economics and finance, come to our Market Waves Conference at the Gaylord Texan Resort and Convention Center in Grapevine, Texas, this November. Visit marketwaves18.com to learn more about this event. That'll do it for today. Thanks for tuning in, and we will see you next week on What What the the truck. Truck.